the feminists failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminists we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to was move another on from era. that. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. A very good afternoon to you and welcome to the show. I'm Vanessa Phelps. This is what's coming up. Victory for waspy women. Ministers face demands for huge payouts to thousands of women. After a watchdog finds the government did fail to tell them about changes to the state pension age. Plus defeat again. The government's flagship Rwanda bill has suffered yet another setback that could see deportation flights delayed until June. And... It's all being done with my brain. If y'all can see the cursor moving around the screen, that's, that's all me, y'all. Elon's X-Man. Stunning footage has been shared of the first person with the Neuralink brain chip using telepathy to play chess on a computer just by thinking. First of all, though, let's have the news headlines with Oliver whitfield Mirchich. Thanks, Vanessa. Good afternoon. The Bank of England's kept the cost of borrowing on hold but hinted cuts could be on the way soon. The rates have remained the same since August. It's keeping the base rate at its 16-year high of 5.25%, as most analysts had predicted. Independent economist Julian Jessup told Talk TV the bank should have taken action months ago. The key point is that monetary policy is supposed to be forward-looking. So although inflation is above the 2% target now, um, looking ahead, it will drop below 2% in April because of what we already know is going to happen to domestic energy bills and probably remain below 2% over the rest of the year. So there's no really good reason to keep interest rates as high as they are now. Wednesday was the busiest day of the year for migrants crossing the Channel. Home Office figures reveal that 10 boats were intercepted, carrying 514 people. Over 4,000 migrants have made the journey so far this year, about 10% higher than the same period in 2023. Well, despite the Prime Minister's repeated pledges to stop the boats, the government has suffered even more defeats to the flagship Rwanda bill. The House of Lords passed seven proposed changes yesterday and say that there needs to be regard for domestic and international law. Times radio presenter James Hansen told Talk Today that most people have just come to terms with the fact that flights won't be heading to the African nation anytime soon. The public don't expect to see these flights taking off anytime soon, if ever. MPs aren't surprised. I think the government privately will admit they, you know, if they get one flight off between now and the election, whenever that is, they'll be very happy. But you're right, you know, there's a huge backlog and it does make you wonder why, from a bureaucratic point of view, can't we clear it? And in fairness to the government, on certain things, remember the passport office had massive issues a few years ago. Yeah. If you renewed your passport, you couldn't get one for months. They've cleared that now. A mother who carried out a campaign of cruelty against her three-year-old son has been convicted of his murder. Christina Robinson, who's 30, lost her temper and violently shook her son, Dwellanaya, at their family home in Durham in November 2022. In the weeks prior, she had deliberately immersed him in scalding water, causing severe and painful burns. The government says it will consider the findings of a report which says women affected by the change in the state pension age in 2010 are owed compensation. The Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman says authorities failed to properly inform people when the pension age rose from 60 to 65. It's been recommended that eligible females should receive payouts of up to £3,000, but WASPI Chair Angela Madden says the report doesn't go far enough. I think the Ombudsman has brought quite a lot into his judgment because there are so many of us i think perhaps his judgment is tempered to make it overall less expensive on the taxpayer and really that shouldn't be his concern and the queen has told well wishers in belfast that the king is doing very well queen camilla is attending a number of events in northern ireland and has met the region's political leaders she was handed a get well card for her husband who's been treated for cancer Camilla, herself an avid reader, marked World Poetry Day by watching spoken word performances and met authors and actors. 
You're all up to date here on Talk TV. More news and views in just a few minutes, but first the weather with Isabel Lang. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV weather. Well, the weather is set to turn colder tomorrow. Not great news, quite a chilly weekend coming up. It's behind this cold front here that's gradually bringing some increasingly wet and rather windy weather southeast was across the British Isles. Ahead of it, it's still in the mild air, though, and there will be some sunshine to uh, end the day across the south with temperatures up into the mid to high teens. But it's not particularly pleasant under the wind and rain across Northern Ireland, Southern Scotland, Northern England, and that wet weather will continue to sink steadily southwards this evening. Behind it, blustery with showers. And We'll find that increasingly chilly air coming in across the northern half of the country through tonight. Maybe a touch of frost, but definitely some fairly hefty and possibly wintry showers there. Many central areas keeping this zone of cloud, rain and fairly brisk winds, though. That will gradually push its way down towards the southeast later in the night. It does mean that if you're out first thing tomorrow, there will be some pretty persistent rain for a time, particularly stretching from the southwest up into the south Midlands, then the home counties in East Anglia. That rain, though, gradually pushing away through the afternoon. And then for the rest of us, it's a bright and breezy end to the week with sunshine and showers, but definitely turning chillier. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Many thanks to Isabel and to Oliver. Let's move on now to our top story. Women affected by the increase in the state pension age are owed compensation and an apology from the government. That is the verdict of a long-awaited report into how those born in the 1950s were affected by their retirement age being bumped from 60 to 65 to bring it in line with men. Initial plans were to raise the threshold and to phase it out from 2010 to 2020, but the coalition government of 2010 decided to speed that up, so it was introduced by 2018 instead. Women against state pension inequality, known as the WASPy women, say they were unaware of the changes and therefore didn't receive their pension when they expected to. According to today's report, victims could get a payout of up to £2,950, despite some suffering financial losses of £40,000 or more. Joining me now in the studio, Talk TV's political correspondent Alicia Fitzgerald. Good to see you, Alicia. And down the line, we're joined by Becky O'Connor, Head of Pensions at Interactive Investor, and Francis Coppola, a finance writer. Thank you all for joining me. Why don't we start with Alicia just to set the scene? Um, so this is something... That, that many women found came as the most cataclysmic shock, isn't it? They, yeah. they had thought that they were retiring at the age of 60 and their pensions would kick in. They had planned sensibly, living their lives to that moment, knowing that their funds would run that long if they were working that long. And then they were suddenly told that the goalposts had changed and they argued that they hadn't known it hadn't been properly communicated. Yeah, this is all part of the government really just trying to keep people in work really over a long space of time. I mean, our productivity is at a record low and the government have just needed some way to try and keep people working as long as possible. And this is something that they did to try and ensure that that happened. Now, the women are claiming that because of this, they are now owed a big sum of money. And an ombudsman has suggested to the Department of Work and Pensions that they give that money over pretty pro quickly. Mm -hmm. The government seems to just be very, very firm on the fact that they don't feel like that is the case whatsoever. And they've pretty much rejected all calls for this money to be paid. So definitely a bit of an upset there between the two sides. And, and, and even as this Ombudsman report was being filed and made public, those who compiled it have already said, we're, we're saying this, this is what we recommend, and we don't think the government will deliver, which is the most extraordinary state of affairs, really, isn't it? It is, for sure. But, I mean, if you look at the broader kind of political landscape here, the government really have had this big push of keeping people in work for quite some time now. Mm -hmm. So if they now sort of turn around and just, you know, start giving money to, to lots of these women here who feel that they've been wronged, people will say, well, hang on, if you have the money to give to them, why don't you have the money to give to X, Y, Z, various other things at the moment? Obviously, the government say that they're very much strapped for cash at the moment and there's lots of things really pulling at the purse strings. So I think if they did give the money out here, they would then open themselves up to a lot more questions about why they can't do that um, for other sectors too. All right, let's bring Becky O'Connor into the conversation, Head of Pensions at Interactive Investor. Becky, from your perspective, how have you watched this story unfold? and what do you think are the crucial elements here? 
Well, as we know, the women, the campaign group has been going for many years. Um, the Ombudsman has been looking at this for many years. So this is a culmination of a huge amount of work. Um, now, in terms of the transition for these women um, and whether or not it's fair um, that they, they, they have suffered um, and uh, whether or not the compensation is now fair, it is still being debated. And yet we do now have a decision finally from the Ombudsman, something to work towards. Now, certainly there's a huge amount of strength of feeling from both the campaign group, but also the families of people affected. Um, some women have been affected more than others. And I think that the, you know, what we have now is a judgment that recognizes exactly what went wrong, when it went wrong, after having looked through all the evidence, trying to make a, a dispassionate decision when there is so much strength of feeling out there. And I'm really pleased with the results. Wait, what does it say did go wrong and when did it go wrong? What does the report pinpoint as the crucial thing that you have said is the is the most interesting and most important factor of the report? What what went wrong and when? So what it says is that there weren't widespread failings all along from the point at which the legislation changed, which is 1995, to the point um, at which the, the age changed, which was from 2010 onwards, but it does pinpoint a moment in time around 2005 when the DWP was not communicating the right things at the right time to the right people. So the report says there was a failure to give accurate, adequate and timely information that proved to these women that they may have been hearing things on the radio, they may have seen campaigns, but that what they said was there was a gap between awareness and understanding, and that could have been closed if the communication had been better, if letters had been sent personally around that time to those who were going to be affected, outlining exactly how they were going to be affected. And that didn't happen at this specific moment in time, and this is where the compensation has been judged to be payable. So how, how does the report find that these women were communicated with if they were communicated with? So if they didn't receive individual personal letters saying, dear Miss Smith, you think that you're going to get your pension at this date, but you're not, you're not going to get it till five, almost six years later. So it's very important, absolutely imperative that you make other plans and think about what you're going to do and how you're going to survive for those six years. If if they didn't get those letters, what did they get? How has the DWP been able to argue all, the, all these years that it did inform them? So what the DWP did do was um, issued leaflets. Um, there was lots on the news. There were radio and TV notifications. There was information on the website. And I think the hope was that over the years, this information would filter through. And it, it, you know, it was um, over several years. Um, but from the DWP's own evidence from surveys, um, it could see that the, the message wasn't necessarily getting through to the target audience. And so women weren't able to make adequate plans. And it does take an awful long time to plan properly for retirement, particularly if you have to play catch up, mm. um, you know, on, based on years where you weren't paying in enough because you were assuming your state pension age was 60 rather than 65. So it, it did do this sort of widespread mainstream efforts um, through the press and through leafleting and so on. But what has been found is that it didn't make the specific communications that would have potentially made a difference to the affected individuals. When you said just now, Becky, that the DWP could see that the message wasn't getting through, how could the DWP see that? And could they and should they have done something to rectify it if they were aware that it wasn't permeating in the way that they hoped it would? So surveys were conducted to test the awareness of this group of women, 3.8 million approximately, um, to see if they had... Um, understood the implications of um, the communications that were going out but not necessarily directly to them and those surveys did apparently um, not uh, demonstrate good awareness among that population. Let me bring Francis Coppola into this, a finance writer. Have you written much about this Francis? I think I, it's dominated my life for a long time. I've written a lot about this over the years and, um, and experienced a fair amount of abuse because my position from the start was that I didn't think that um, the legislation itself was wrong and I didn't think women should be compensated for the loss of their pensions. Uh -huh. But do but what this is about and what the, the ombudsman has found is not that the legislation itself was wrong, not that there's a case for compensating women for the loss of their pensions, but there is a case for some mishandling of the communication um, 
by the DWP and some compensation for that. So the compensation that's being offered is very, very much lower than many women believe they should receive. Let, let me ask you why your standpoint the whole time when you say this has dominated your life for years has been women don't deserve compensation and there's nothing wrong with the legislation. Why did you, why did you decide that was your point of view? Well, the first thing was that this legislation was passed in 1995 and the announcement was made in the budget in 1993. Mm. Now, Parliament has the right to set pension ages and it can change them. People have this idea that your state pension age at the time, that many of these women seem to have had this idea that they were told when they started work at 17 or something that their pen state pension age would be 60 and that would never change. But that mm. was never the case. And in fact, I remember going back to my sixth form in the 1970s that once the Equal Pay Act had been passed uh, and the Sex Discrimination Act, that we knew that state pension ages had to be equalised. It was only a question of when and at what age. Now, lots of us thought it would be at 63, so men's would come down a bit, women's go up a bit. But then in 1965, the Chancellor decided to equalise them at 65, and he had every right to do that. They made a 15-year delay to ensure that older women weren't affected and then did a 10-year gradual introduction which affected particularly women over the birth years 1950 to 55. That was accelerated in, 19, in 2011 and I actually think the acceleration was unfair but it's not the acceleration that's been criticised by the Ombudsman. Mm -hmm. It's actually the way the original increase was communicated from 2005 onwards. Well, I've been discussing this on, on the radio first of all at the BBC now here for years mm -hmm. and years. And each time the women affected, uh, Francis, have argued that they weren't told, they didn't know, they were not party to any of the different forums at which this news was revealed. They just didn't know. And that if they had known, being highly responsible, extremely bright, you know, perfectly competent people, they would have um, allowed for it and prepared for it. And they would have, you know, known what was happening and they would have led, led their lives accordingly. But they didn't know, they didn't realise. And each time the women said this more and more vocally in a more kind of organised collective way with better people representing them, you know, more different podia all over the place. The DWP said, yes, you did know. Yes, we told you. Yes, you were in full, fully in command of the facts. No, this isn't true. Yes, you're bleating about something that is entirely your own fault. Am I exaggerating or is that really what's been going on for the last... I don't know, 20 years. That is years. pretty much what's been going on, yes, yeah. absolutely. And so now, uh, do you think these women are, are vindicated? Because now this, the Ombudsman's report has said, actually, they didn't know. They never did wake up in the morning and get a letter saying, Mrs Bloggs, you're not going to get your pension until you're 65. That didn't happen. And it is possible not to realise that an item on the news pertains to you or not to have been watching the news that day or not to have been aware that there was some really relevant story because nobody told you. And in pre-social media days, it was easy, wasn't it, to, 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 to kind of find that the news kind of happened somewhere over there without your ever thinking you were really a part of it, or at least I, I think it was. If I can say, I'm actually one of the women affected. Right. Um, and I knew, um, and I know many other women who knew. Mm -hmm. And actually, the, the uh, Ombudsman's report does say there are women who knew. Yes. Um, the problem was the women who didn't know. Well, I suppose um, you were a finance it, writer. You should have known. I mean, you would I have wasn't known it's your at the job. Time. You weren't. I wasn't at the time. No, right. I wasn't. How did you um, find so out then? How do you know? How I did found you come out back? because I. I found out because it was actually reported on BBC, uh, BBC Radio's Woman's Hour. Right, um, right. I had a at the time and I was listening to Woman's there Hour. Could it could have been that you were having a That's sandwich in the that. other room and you were doing the ironing or having marvellous time in the exactly. theatre and you didn't so, know, couldn't it? Look, yeah. I guess the finding of the Ombudsman is the DWP could have done better in communicating this. And in particular, once it discovered in 2004 that um, lots of women didn't really know either didn't know that it was going up at all or didn't know by how much, mm -hmm. um, that it could have done a lot better and it should have done. And that's the finding of the Ombudsman. The Ombudsman's not finding that the actual rise was wrong. It's saying the way it was communicated was not yeah. good enough. And, Becky, and, let, and let me talk to you, Becky, for a minute about women and pensions in general, because certainly many women have been... It's not, I don't want to say felt that they were. I'm going to say they were. They were ill-used by the pension structure because of having to take time off 
to have children and care for their children and the way in which it was all fudged together so that it meant that you'd missed out on years of paying in, but actually men didn't miss out in the same way, even though they were the fathers of the children and it wasn't really at all fair or equal. So this bringing it into some kind of equality and making everybody 65 is only OK if men are equally penalised for taking time off paying their pensions, uh, paying their, their contributions, because they're also uh, fathers of children. Not, it's not just the mothers who are missing out. So are you often dealing with women who, who have got these sparse, gappy-looking pensions with bits missing and therefore what they get at the end isn't what it ought to be? Sadly, yes. And if I may say that the situation isn't historic, it's ongoing. Because exactly. Because we still have a situation where paternity leave isn't paid at the same rate as maternity leave. Women tend to get more when they take time off from their employers and therefore they tend to spend more time off. And so, yeah. the, you know, we may have equality in terms of the state pension age now, but we don't really have that equality yet in the workplace, which was one of the justifications um, supposedly for the um, equality of the state pension age. So it's still a problem. There's a 35% official gender pension gap. Yeah. Um, to give you an idea, most men retire with well over £100,000 and most women well below. Um, the, the, the gap is 35%, 38%. So it, it's significant. It's not narrowing very quickly. Women are increasing their contributions. We can see that with our own customer base to try and make up for their own personal gender pension gap. But while we still have this situation, while that women are taking more time out to care for children, taking longer periods out of work, we don't have that equality even within private pensions. And, and is there any advice, Becky, that you can give women who find themselves in this position or might not yet be in this position but better look to it to make sure they're not going to be? You know, are there things that women can do to keep abreast, keep in control and make sure they know what's going on a bit better? So one thing that women who are taking time out of work can do is make sure they're claiming national insurance credits if they're caring for children. This is really important. It means that you still get the same entitlement to the state pension that you would have had had you been working. Mm -hmm. It's a recognition that that time out is still valuable. Um, otherwise, in terms of paying into personal pensions or workplace pensions, you can still pay into them up to £3,600 a year if you aren't working and aren't earning. You could also ask partners to pay into your pension for you. Um, besides that, you know, making hay while the sun shines when you are in work and you are able to increase your contributions to try and keep up um, with your own kind of goals for retirement and make sure that you're not missing out as a result of having taken time out to care for children. Thank you all very much indeed and I really hope that uh, the compensation as it's been decreed that it's valid and it's owing is paid nice and quickly. Coming up after the break, the House of Lords inflicts fresh defeat on the government over its flagship Rwanda bill, meaning a likely delay to it becoming law. I'm Vanessa Feltz, you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs> 
There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. Rishi Sunak suffered another blow to his Rwanda bill after a series of heavy defeats in the House of Lords, which means the first flights could now be delayed until June, past the Prime Minister's timeline. The government lost seven votes as peers backed changes that aim to water down the controversial legislation to deport migrants to the East African nation. These include provisions to ensure due regard for international law and that Rwanda is a safe country. The bill must now return to the Commons, where MPs will once again vote on the changes, but this now won't take place until after Easter. Still with me in this studio, Talk TV's political correspondent Alicia Fitzgerald, now joined by political commentator Jonathan Liss, and down the line, chief political correspondent at The Times, Aubrey Allegretti. Thank you all for being here. Why don't we start with Aubrey? Aubrey, um, this is just so thuddingly predictable, isn't it? We've had it happen before. How could anyone have thought it wasn't going to happen again? This was very predictable, yes. The, the House of Lords effectively... Uh, reinserted seven amendments, watering back down the Rwanda bill, and this sends it back to the Commons. What I think was less expected was for the government then to be seemingly dragging its feet in terms of trying to take these amendments back out again once it gets to the House of Commons. Because we heard today from Penny Morden, who's the leader of the House of Commons, and effectively announces the business in the House of Commons chamber and what MPs are going to vote on when, that this legislation... Uh, it now isn't going to be voted on again by MPs until at least the 15th of April. Now, people might be slightly baffled by that, considering that there are still a few days left of Parliament before it sort of breaks for Easter. MPs are supposed to be here all the way until next Tuesday. And you will remember as well that when the Supreme Court struck down the Rwanda plan in the first place, in the middle of last November, the government promised emergency legislation. Well, here we are four months hence and nearly two years on from the moment Priti Patel signed the original deal and we still haven't got flights in the air, putting at risk Rishi Sunak's pledge to be able to deliver that by spring this year. Alicia, I mean, this was inevitable really, wasn't it? And how could anyone have not thought so? And if the Prime Minister knew it was inevitable, why are we in this position? Well, I mean, Aubrey's absolutely right in saying it doesn't really scream emergency legislation when it's going to be delayed yet again until potentially after Easter. I mean, this has been going along for a really long time now. And now what we've seen yesterday is just a further delay to this policy, which seems to be falling at so many obstacles repeatedly again and again. Mm. So what happens now, it goes back to the House of Commons, they basically decide whether or not those Lords amendments are what they want added to the bill. Chances are they probably won't want them added to the bill as well. Let's remember that. And then we're just going to be in this phase where they basically have to find a compromise for the wording they want on this legislation until it can become law. Let's also remember that there's a chance as well that even if it does become law, there are other logistical issues with it as well to see whether or not actually these flights will take off. But some people are arguing that actually the reason that the government did delay it until after Easter is so they can kind of have a bit more time to nail 
all of the other issues with it down before it does become legislation. So that could be a bit of a hint as to why they made that decision yesterday. And also, Vanessa, they don't actually have very much on the legislative agenda. It's the kind of the unspoken, open secret of Westminster says the government has completely run out of steam and it doesn't have any major legislation in the pipeline. People say it's the emptiest parliament has been in their political lifetimes. And so you know, it could just be that the government doesn't have anything in the, in the pipeline. And so, you know, it kind of it's quite convenient you know, just to keep um, kicking the can down the road and sort of running down the clock until the election. But I think also, Vanessa, we have to bear in mind what the amendments are that the government, that the Lords has just voted for. Well, I've just these, run through a few right, of them. These are, one, right, these one are... of them, you know, that Rwanda is a safe country, that is the thing that the Supreme Court ruled that it was not, isn't it? Our own Supreme right. Court, the highest uh, seat of justice in the land, said it is not a safe country, so you can't send people there. And, and, and here's the Lords, quite rightly, you might say, resurrecting this objection, which is pretty pivotal. You can't send people to somewhere that they're not going to be safe. So how is that ever going to be ironed out? How is the government ever going to make that look as if it doesn't exist? Well, you have, you know, some difference of political options. Either the Lords eventually sort of bows to the Commons will, which is what happens in the past. The Lords sort of makes its its, its opinion and then the, the Commons eventually sort of force it through. Mm -hmm. The Lords could actually sort of remain defiant on this. It's not a manifesto commitment. That's really the only convention uh, whereby the Lords doesn't uh, vote down completely mm -hmm. um, Commons legislation, uh, in which case the government would have to uh, enforce the Parliament Act, but they'd have to wait until uh, a change of Parliament, and uh, there's no time for that. So actually, the Lords does have options. I think it's really important for viewers and listeners to know what are the amendments, because there are a couple of really crucial ones. There's one that simply says that uh, they need reassurances that Rwanda is a safe country, i.e. it's in the treaty provisions. That was, because, as you just said, the Supreme Court has stated that Rwanda is not a safe country. And so what the, what the Parliament has now, what the Commons has now done, is said, well, actually, we're saying it is a safe country. Uh, so yours, I'm saying this table is black, mm -hmm. but now I'm going to make a new law now that actually says it's red. Mm -hmm. And now we all have to say it's red. It's like a fiction. It's a complete fiction. And understandably, people are quite concerned about that. You can override any kind of court judgment by simply saying the court, what we what the court has established, we're going to make a law that says the court is wrong. Yes. So that's that's not that's not in keeping with the separation of powers. So let me let me bring Aubrey in because I just want you, Aubrey, to establish whether you think that Jonathan Liss is overstating this, that he's saying that, you know, they're taking what what, what the Supreme Court has said and saying we're now going to change the law so the Supreme Court is no longer right, it's now wrong, and that that is just effectively weaving a work of fiction. I think we should discuss this, and your answer should come, in the light of the information that's been made available only about half an hour ago, which is that yesterday more people crossed over to this country on small boats. I think it was 513, more than on any other day previously. The weather was nice yesterday, obviously the sea was calm and more people arrived than we've ever had in one single day before. So in the light of that, what what is your response to what Jonathan's saying? Just in case people listening or watching are thinking, well, he's overstating it. He's really, you know, he's making a big old deal of it. Is he or isn't he, Aubrey? Well, it's not a view just espoused by people on the left. It is also a view uh, espoused by people like Ken Clark a former Conservative cabinet minister, uh, including a former chancellor. Mm -hmm. And he gave a very lengthy speech in the House of Lords not too long ago, where he made a very similar argument. He said, you know, some things we cannot argue are white if we know them to be black. Uh, there are immutable truths in this world. And so there is, um, I suppose, a difference to how this issue is being handled in the House of Lords, to different issues where sometimes peers do sort of back down you know, they're meant to be a sort of backstop to say to the House of Commons, are you sure, have you thought about this, here are some suggestions. But then they do tend to sort of get out of the way if the MPs do express their will. And in this instance, because there are such sort of profound moral and constitutional objections by some peers, including crossbenchers and conservatives as well, let's not forget that, um, you know, they, they make up a very big part of the amount of peers altogether. Those are the people that also have concerns. It's not just about the Labour Party trying to block this. But as you said, it is going to become more pertinent an issue because, as we saw yesterday, the highest daily number of arrivals on small boats occurred. We're now, I think, at around 10% more of arrivals than we were this time last year. Now, the government will say that's still down on what it was over the last few years. But Rishi Sidnak is really in a bind if he wants to deliver on his promise to get flights away by the spring.
So, Lucia, so much for stop the small boats and then you're standing on a podium with a sign saying stop them more people than ever before in one day yesterday. Definitely. And, and the thing is, is the government have really put so much focus on stopping illegal migration that they're kind of in too deep now to really, really go back on this. I mean, this is the policy that Rishi Sunak has kind of nailed his whole premiership to. His whole leadership has been based on this one policy. So to kind of dip out now and maybe, you know, reevaluate things or actually choose to kind of put emphasis on something else, it is kind of too late for him to do that. He really kind of just needs to make this work somehow. OK, let's make this discussion veer slightly off course, just because because you have said, and, and, and I mean, it, it seems to me that the way every word you say is crystal clear and absolutely, obviously, apparently, absolutely true. You know, Rishi Sunak has nailed his colours to a particular mast. That mast is stop the small boats. He hasn't stopped them. We know he hasn't because yesterday more people arrived than ever before. Plus the Rwandan solution, nobody's gone anywhere. It's been an absolutely catastrophically expensive, so far, waste of space. Who knows what might happen, but so far an absolute waste of space. Right, Keir Starmer hasn't, it seems to me at any rate, please correct me if I'm wrong or if you disagree, that's fine, hasn't really nailed his colours to any mast at all. He stayed absolutely ineffably vague about anything and everything, so you don't really know what he thinks, what he's going to try to do, what changes he's going to make. You know he's not really keen on the Rwandan solution, but you don't know what else he has in mind. You know he's not keen on lots of things, but you're not sure, apart from possibly really taking away the charitable status of private schools, you're not really sure what he's thinking of doing about anything. But my question for all three of you political pundits is this, is that terrifically wise of him? He hasn't got Ed Miliband's tablet of stone in which he said what he's going to do and what he's going to do. He's really said absolutely nothing at all. Alicia, was this, was this very, very clever? Is this politicking at its best? Well, first of all, I just say, careful, he might hear you. Yeah, I know um, he's in the <laughs> building somewhere. I hope he does hear me. That's why I'm saying especially loudly. I want him to run in through the door and tell me it's not That'd true. That'd be fun. Unless you're wrong, you're maligning me, I've got all kinds of policies and all sorts of things I'm absolutely ready to do right up my sleeve. Well, let's just remind people what his plans are for illegal migration. So, so far, the emphasis for the Labour Party has been very much on tackling the criminal gangs. The trouble is, and there's something that lots of the public have said, is how do you tackle the criminal gangs? It's a really, really sophisticated operation, hence why it's so successful. So to say you're going to tackle it is really going to be a really, really big task. Yeah. Secondly, more recently, he said that he wants to put some focus on employers who are illegally, knowingly employing illegal migrants into their businesses and therefore kind of protecting them with some kind of um, shelter there and obviously providing them with, with money. Um, and he said that he wants to sort out that. But as you say, mm -hmm. and he, oh, sorry, also he's also wants to have created um, better returns agreements and better relationships with European countries mm -hmm. to try and stop um, migrants coming along their journey before they reach the UK. So those are three things. Lots of people will say that that isn't really enough. The thing is that the Rwanda policy does is it's a catchphrase. Mm -hmm. It's easy for people to say, the, the government want to, you know, send people to Rwanda. It's not so easy to say, well, the Labour Party wants to have closer ties with the EU. They want to do this with employers. They want to do this. It, it doesn't have a kind of policy ring to it. And I think that's what people All are right. looking for. All right. I want one short line from Jonathan. Is he wise not to say what he wants to do or how he's going to do it? Look, he's 25 points ahead in the polls at the moment. He doesn't actually need uh, to sort of to, to do what Alicia is saying. Mm. He's sitting back and watching his enemy making mistakes. And my God, is the enemy, is the enemy making mistakes right now? Or, Aubrey, or final line on Keir Starmer, whether he should or shouldn't at least have a policy or two? Well, I think Labour would argue that they have uh, suggested that, for example, migrants be allowed to be processed by UK customs officials in France to be able to... Uh, stop asylum seekers needing to come to the UK in order to claim asylum. And again, there seems to be this criticism that Labour leader Keir Starmer sort of stood for nothing. And then the Conservatives made great hay out of the fact that he had pledged this £28 billion green investment plan. I mean, that's sounding quite ambitious. And he did junk it because obviously he said he wouldn't be able to afford it necessarily anymore. But um, I think, again, Keir Starmer's playing it safe and it doesn't seem to be hurting him in the polls. Thank you all very much indeed. Well, Sir Keir Starmer will be talking to The Sun's Harry Cole on the first episode of his new show, Never Mind the Ballots, this evening. Here's a taste of what's to come. Never Mind the Ballots, a brand new look at all things politics from The Sun with me, Harry Cole. This week, watch my exclusive interview with Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer with no topic off limits. Tune in on Thursday evening, exclusively with The Sun.
Never mind, the ballots airs at 8 p.m. tonight on Talk TV. Coming up after the break, working from home probably looks a little different when you live in a palace. That's what the Princess of Wales is doing while she continues her recovery. I'm Vanessa Feltz. You're with Talk on TV, radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. The Princess of Wales is said to be working from home on her early years project as she continues her recovery from abdominal surgery. This is all as three workers from the London Clinic, where Kate had a treatment in January, are currently under investigation for trying to access her private medical records. Today it's emerged that the hospital delayed reporting the breach by a week. Meanwhile, the Queen has been out and about in Northern Ireland today and told crowds there that the King is doing very well amidst his treatment for cancer. Joining us is Talk TV's Royal Editor Sarah Hewson. Sarah, good to have you on the programme. A great deal going on. Shall we start with the London Clinic? Because that's what we were talking about yesterday on the programme. And we hear that they delayed reporting the fact that people tried to access Kate's private medical records by a week. Yes, the timeline's not exactly uh, clear, Vanessa, but it has been reported that the London Clinic, which, if there is any suspicion of a data breach, there is a duty to report it to uh, 
the data control of the information commissioner's office at the privacy watchdog effectively within 72 hours and it's been claimed today that uh, the london clinic may not have done that for a week now the information commissioner's office as we know is now investigating this they will be looking into uh, whether there were any failings on the part of the london clinic to uh, protect patient data whether any of their processes were not put in place uh, stringently enough for example and I think this could be extremely damaging for the London Clinic because this is a private hospital that prides itself, that's built its entire reputation on its high profile clients who demand discretion and privacy. And of course, we had that statement from the chief executive yesterday saying that this was taken with the utmost seriousness, but the consequences indeed could be serious depending on what the information commissioner finds. And now we know that it's not one member of staff, but three who are being investigated. So it sounds a little bit like a sort of uh, collaboration of a kind of internal gang trying to crack the secret code to Kate's private medical information. Yes, three members of staff potentially involved in this attempt to access uh, Kate's medical records, her hospital notes. Now, we understand that that attempt took place after she'd left the hospital. She was admitted on the 16th of January, as you'll remember, she was in hospital for 13 days. It's not clear exactly how long afterwards, but at some point, uh, individuals uh, working within the London Clinic, uh, it is alleged, tried to access that medical information information. We don't actually know whether they managed to. All of that will be a part of that investigation from the Information Commissioner. Let's talk a little bit about Kate working from home because we've only heard really so far that she was convalescing and that she was recuperating and that we wouldn't see her until after Easter. But we didn't know that she was doing what so many others of us are doing, which is working from home. Yes, I mean, Kensington Palace is a bit reluctant to commit to the fact she's actually technically working from home. I don't think they want us to sort of see that she's in her sick bed on her laptop, for example. But certainly she's been kept abreast of key work from her early years foundation. And this has been described as her life's work. And there's been a report into its successes today. Now, a particular pilot project, the Baby Observation Tool, that was funded by uh, the Princesses uh, Foundation, has been reviewed by Oxford University, and it has been found to be overwhelmingly positive. Now, this is a system used by health visitors. It was first observed uh, by the Princess of Wales when she visited Denmark uh, in 2022. And uh, they've done a pilot scheme in two areas where health visitors use this scale to evaluate things like eye contact, uh, engagement from a baby, any kind of distress calls to try and monitor their emotional and social development and also those key parent infant relationships and the plan now is that this is going to get rolled out further uh, to more health visitors and ultimately the long-term aim is that this should be a part of all health visitors work nationwide. I mean this is very important and I don't always join the dots on this program but people who watch or listen regularly will know that only the other day we did an item about how vitally important it is that babies of 22 months actually meet various targets and are, you know, for, for example, as you say, making eye contact, responding to being spoken to, you know, learning the sorts of things they need to learn. Because if they don't, they will fall dramatically and drastically behind by the age of 16. And that you can see the markers of that as young as 22 months. If they're already not doing what they need to do at that age, you can see the terrible effects of it on their entire lives stretching before them. So what she's doing is incredibly important and also mm -hmm. extremely overdue that this should be taken seriously that early years is as important as Kate thinks and knows that it is. Yes, and it's very much her focus. And what this particular project is doing is putting the baby right at the centre of any kind of uh, focus by those health visitors. And, and in those very early years, that is when a baby's brain, a child's brain, is developing at its fastest rate. So the implications for what happens in those early years will be felt in adulthood, uh, in their teenage years and into adulthood as well. So this is absolutely key. The Prince of Wales alluded to it when he was in Sheffield this week and they started talking about childhood and the early years. And he said, that's very much my wife's territory. She should be here listening to this. And I think she's 
definitely keeping across all of those developments. And when she does come back to work in April, I think it is certain that that will really be the focus for her getting back to that core work. Sarah, thank you very much indeed. This is what's coming up after the break. Elon Musk releases astonishing footage of the first person to use the Neuralink brain chip to control a computer. I'm Vanessa Feltz and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, missing. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. Elon Musk has shared stunning footage of the first person to use his Neuralink brain chip to control a computer cursor and play video games simply by thinking. This really is incredible. The groundbreaking patient, Noland Arbal, who is a paraplegic after freak, a freak diving accident, was seen in a video using just his mind to play a game of chess. It's all being done with my brain. If y'all can see the cursor moving around the screen, that's that's all me, y'all. Um, it's pretty cool, huh? <laughs> actually, can you pause the song just for the yeah, audio absolutely. coming through? There we and go. that was also done with your brain. Yep. <laughs> it's all brain power up there. Absolutely extraordinary, isn't it? Joining me now is tech journalist Chris Stokel Walker. Chris. Hello, thanks for joining me. How does it work? I mean, obviously, we don't need every single tiny particle of information, but just in general, how do they do it? Yeah, so there is a, a brain plant which has around about a 1,000 electrodes or so and uh, something like 64 threads that are 
uh, linked from that to the brain and then essentially uh, electrical impulses when you say, I want to do this, are then transferred to a computer. And in this instance, obviously, we saw the demo there. Um, the patient was was playing chess, so he decided to try and move a cursor on a computer. And because, um, you know, essentially computers translate uh, inputs into actions, it's able to do that, even if you're not actually moving the mouse, but instead, if you're thinking about doing it. So it is pretty significant and pretty interesting, although it is worth pointing out, this isn't necessarily hugely new technology. And 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 how did 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 the gentleman have to have an actual operation under anaesthetic for this to be implanted? Yeah, he did, Vanessa. And actually, this is you know to, to Elon Musk's credit, and um, you know there are a lot of things to kind of harangue him about. Uh, this is the thing that Neuralink, his his company that is involved in this, is trying to uh, solve. So, you know, I mentioned this technology isn't necessarily new. There was a company called BrainGate that's been doing this since the mid 2000s and essentially doing a kind of similar procedure and a similar process where you implant a, a chip of sort and you link it to their brain and it translates those brain signals into actual movement. But mm -hmm. what BrainGate was doing in the mid 2000s um, is much clunkier and also the operation was much more involved. So Neuralink, um, you know, while it has uh, involved an operation to get that uh, uh, chip implanted, the, the, the whole scope of this is to essentially try and make it easier and therefore to make it uh, more doable for people to actually have in the instance here, obviously quadriplegics, but you can imagine any number of patients that might make use of this. Absolutely. Um, is it true that there's been an enormous amount of testing on animals, particularly monkeys, to get to this point? There is, and, and this is uh, kind of one of the challenges. Obviously, any sort of scientific development uh, does come with its checks and balances, and you have to make compromises. Uh, Neuralink has, has been criticised for uh, this because um, Elon Musk kind of runs a, a relatively tight ship and, and often doesn't brook much criticism. Uh, he's been wary of having people uh, learn a little bit about this. So we haven't had huge information about this, but a lot of research does seem to suggest uh, that uh, animals have been used in this process in, in a way that maybe many people might feel uncomfortable. But I suppose you know, this is is the story of science more what, more generally. What, what over in the, your the mind, years. Chris, is a kind of best case scenario of something really remarkable that might be achieved using this kind of technology? Well, I think that this in itself is pretty remarkable. I mean, this is a first step, a sort of pilot process of moving a chess piece, but you can go from that to pretty significant uh, decisions. I mean, you think about all of what we do in our day-to-day -day lives and, and the muscle movement that goes into that. Um, you know, if you can actually make that artificial, then you can do almost anything. For example? Uh, you, you could, uh, I don't know, you could, if you're a quadriplegic, you could suddenly start to be able to walk again. You could... Uh, control uh, a wheelchair in a way that you wouldn't be able to ordinarily. Mm. You could you know, potentially do some sort of work or, or, or play around and, and do all sorts of things. This is amazing. Thank you very much indeed for explaining it so beautifully. This is what's coming up after the break. The impact of plummeting global birth rates. I'm Vanessa Feltz and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. 
they might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, missing. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. A very warm welcome back to the show. I'm Vanessa Feltz, and this is what's coming up this hour. Prepare for staggering social change. Birth rates have tumbled in all major Western nations since 1950, with the trend forecast to continue until 21,000 plus. Holding firm, the Bank of England has kept interest rates at 5.25% for the fifth meeting in a row. So when will they be cut? And what does it mean for your money? And are you eyeing someone up at the water cooler? Is it love? Or have you just got what they're calling office goggles? I will explain more later later on in the show. First of all, though, let's have the news headlines with Oliver whitfield Mircic. Thanks, Vanessa. Good afternoon. The Bank of England's kept the cost of borrowing on hold, but hindered cuts could be on the way soon. The rates have remained the same since August. It's keeping the base rate at its 16-year high, though, of 5.25%, as most analysts had predicted. Independent economist Julian Jessup told Talk TV the bank should have taken action a long time ago. The key point is that monetary policy is supposed to be forward looking. So although inflation is above the 2% target now, um, looking ahead, it will drop below 2% in April because of what we already know is going to happen to domestic energy bills and probably remain below 2% over the rest of the year. So there's no really good reason to keep interest rates as high as they are now. Yesterday was the busiest day of the year for migrants crossing the Channel. Home Office figures reveal that 10 boats were intercepted, carrying 514 people. Over 4,000 migrants have made the journey so far this year, about 10% higher than the same period in 2023. Well, despite the Prime Minister's repeated pledges to stop the boats, the government has suffered even more defeats on the flagship Rwanda bill. The House of Lords passed seven proposed changes yesterday and said there needs to be due regard for domestic and international law. Times radio presenter James Hansen has told Talk Today most people have just come to terms with the fact that flights might not be heading to the African nation. The public don't expect to see these flights taking off any time soon, if ever. MPs aren't surprised. I think the government privately will admit they, you know, if they get one flight off between now and the election, whenever that is, they'll be very happy. But you're right, you know, there's a huge backlog and it does make you wonder why, from a bureaucratic point of view, can't we clear it? And in fairness to the government, on certain things, remember the passport office had massive issues a few years yeah. ago? If you renewed your passport, you couldn't get one for months. They've cleared that now. A mother's been found guilty of murdering her three-year-old son in Durham. Christina Robinson shook Dwellanaya to death after a campaign of violence during which she caned him and forced him into scalding hot water.
thousands of women are owed compensation due to the rise in the state pension age, according to a new report. The Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman says the government increased it to 65 in 2010 without properly communicating it. It's been recommended that eligible females should receive payouts of up to £3,000, but one of the leading campaigners, Angela Madden, says the report doesn't go far enough. I think the Ombudsman has brought quite a lot into his judgment because there are so many of us. I think perhaps his judgment is tempered to make it overall less expensive on the taxpayer and really that shouldn't be his concern. And the Queen has told well-wishers in Belfast that King Charles is doing very well. Queen Camilla is attending a number of events in Northern Ireland and has met the region's political leaders. She was handed a get well card for her husband who's being treated for cancer. Camilla, herself an avid reader, marked World Poetry Day by watching spoken word performances and also met authors and actors. You're all up to date here on Talk TV. Let's take a look at what this evening's weather has in store for us with Isabel Lang. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV weather. We get used to a little bit of warmth and then, well, northwesterly winds come in and they will bring quite a change in the feel of things over the coming 24 hours or so. The cold air tucked in behind these frontal systems that are toppling southeastwards, bringing quite a, a dull, damp picture for many central areas through today. But you can see this evening, this is where the rain is stretching all the way from Southern Ireland, Northern Ireland, through Wales and into uh, Northern England. That will gradually sink southwards through the night. Behind it, we're starting to tap into the colder air behind with showers that could well uh, turn wintry over the hills of Scotland and could see a touch of frost in sheltered parts of eastern Scotland. Now, during the day on Friday, that front will continue to take its rain down into the southeast, so there will be a spell of a few hours of rain that will gradually ease into the afternoon. And then following it, there will be a return to some sunshine, but there'll also be a scattering of blustery showers, especially across northwestern areas where it's chillier. Temperatures about seven in Glasgow, for example. And there'll be more showers to come through Friday night as well, whilst the south sees clear skies as that rain moves down into the near continent. But that does leave us with a really blustery start to the weekend. Low pressure in charge, lots of showers. Definitely take an umbrella with you, that's for sure. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Many thanks to Oliver and to Isabel. Let's move directly to our top story now. Rapidly declining birth rates will see shrinking populations in nearly every country by the end of the century. That's according to a new study. By 2100, it is expected that more than half of all the world's babies will be born in sub-Saharan Africa. That's up from about a quarter in 2021. Meanwhile, the UK's fertility rate has fallen from 2.19 children per woman in 1950 to 1 1.49 in 2021 making it one of the lowest rates in Western Europe. The implications being a shift in the international balance of power as wealthier countries struggle to maintain economic growth and a reliance, of course, on immigration. Joining me in the studio now is journalist and political commentator Mike Buckley. Good to see you, Mike. And down the line, immigration lawyer Harjap Singh Bangal. Good to see you, Harjap. Thank you. And head of the New Deal for Parents at the think tank, which is called Onward, uh, Phoebe Arslanagic Little. Thank you all for joining me. Let's start with you, Mike. Some people watching and listening may think, well, this sounds like a good thing. You know, aren't we always talking about overpopulation? Aren't we talking about too many people, too, too little food, you know, too few resources? Isn't it great if there are fewer of us altogether? Well, it isn't, because for our country to function, we need to replace the population. I mean, obviously, we're aware that, you know, we're all going to get old and we're all going to pass on. Mm. We need to be replacing the population to do that. You, the average woman in the UK needs to have 2.1 children, because obviously not everybody, very sadly, makes it to, you know, full life expectancy. Mm -hmm. But one and a half well, children. Stop you. When per you say woman, we need we need to replace the population, why do we? When we're always talking about things like not enough school places, not enough houses, not enough social housing. This is a small island. If we get more and more people coming on small boats, yesterday we had the highest number ever crossing over in one single day, over five hundred people. Then there won't be room for all these people 
people. So why do we need to replace ourselves? Well, bluntly, because we're going to get old. <laughs> you know, we're not we're not going to be sitting here on the TV talking forever. Right. Um, your your viewers are not going to be doing their jobs forever, or bringing up their own children, or mm. you know, whatever it is. Mm. So we need people who are going to pay taxes to pay for our health care, to pay for our social care. But if we also fewer, need people. But if there are fewer of us. Then there's less of a demand on the well, NHS, and so we need less healthcare. Thing don't is, we? there's a lot of us. If we're being replaced by a few people, those few people are not going to be able to pay enough tax to keep us in health and social care as we get older, or in housing, or you know, running public services, or doing all the jobs. Those people have to come from somewhere. They either come because we have children, or they become people because of inward immigration. Now we can make that. Well, we are effectively making that choice as a nation by not having enough children. Mm -hmm. We are making it inevitable that we're going to have to bring in work, bring in working age population to the UK, so that we can get old and still have a functioning economy and society. Okay, let, let, let me let me bring Harjap into this. Harjap, we're constantly speaking on this program. You and I, we're always talking about migrants, legal ones, illegal migrants. You know, stopping the small boats. You know, the the, the slowness of processing people who have already arrived here, all this kind of a thing. And the and the kind of thrust of the conversation and the sort of um, environment of our discussion is always too many, too many. We haven't got room, there are just too many people, too many. And suddenly we're lamenting a possibility of too few. This is weird for us, right? Yeah, I mean, it's weird, but um, as your guest said, it might be necessary. So whilst at the moment we can say that there's a pressure on com uh, communities and there's a pressure on the NHS and there's a pressure on schools, et cetera, et cetera. In the future, it looks like that we won't have the consumers and we won't have the suppliers. And so therefore what's gonna happen is society will crumble unless we have people there to populate it. Now, we can do it two ways. We can either start having children and do our bit for our nation as such, or what we can do is what will happen is people will come from outside and replace uh, replace a workforce, replace the consumers, replace the residents. And th these things just naturally happen. It's not just Great Britain or not just the UK. Um, these figures that have come out now, they relate, relate to countries such as the USA, um, to all European countries, and suggest that the, the highest population uh, growth will be uh, in Africa or uh, in the Arab uh, Arabian states, um, as opposed to the European states and the American states. So despite what we hear on a daily basis, the long term plan will require uh, the population being replaced. And we can see in countries like Japan, where people less and less people are getting married, and there's a lot of elderly people, we, we are now seeing that a lot of the cab drivers are now elderly people having to work in order to, to keep the whole system alive. You know, there's, uh, because there's a, a lack of marriages going on, there's a lack of children, um, no one's inheriting houses, no one's inheriting wealth or carrying on the family line. So as such, to avoid them sort of problems that countries such as Japan might be in, um, we need to be planning for this for the future. Therefore, is it time we changed our attitude, huh, Jap? to migrants and migration instead of, you know, flinching and wincing and making, you know, p policies out of trying to stop it? Are we supposed to change our mindset and start to welcome it more enthusiastically? Well, rather than opposed to a blanket welcome, we should, the system of this country should always be that good migrants or migrants who are useful to this country, skilled labour or migrants who will abide by the rules, who enter here legally, should be welcomed. And as opposed to migrants who come here and commit crimes or are going to be a drain on a system or are not going to contribute to society, then that, you know, they should not not be welcome. It's very easy. We should migration is something we can choose. So we can choose to keep the best and the brightest people, but we should also choose to not have or exclude the people who don't benefit to us. It's a very sort of simple thing. We can't blanket welcome everyone who's who's good um you know who, who's here we have limits and we have to set set numbers so this is the balance that the government needs to do and unfortunately the government doesn't seem to be able to be doing that it's it cannot differentiate the systems for doing that have totally broken down so you know we we should welcome anyone who wants to contribute to our society and we should be aware of people who want to do damage to our society. It's Let me simple, bring Phoebe it? into this conversation. So Phoebe, you heard Ajap say there, you know, well, we've got a choice really, we've got to welcome people in from abroad, you know, so they will take the place of the people that we're not reproducing and we're, you know, going forth and multiplying, 
or we can just have more children ourselves. That's the other thing we could do. We could step up for the nation and just reproduce a bit more uh, enthusiastically. Um, is it as simple as that? Can we? Can most families just make the choice to have more children, or is there a good reason why they're not doing it? Well, I think that there's a happily an easy middle way here, which is, first of all, that immigration is clearly going to be an important part of replenishing our working age population, and we're going to need it and going to need to rely on it, and it's extremely important. But at the same time, we do have a birth gap in the UK. You know, it's pretty clear from the data that people are having fewer children than they want. So really, I think this is somewhere for government public policy to come in and have a look at the barriers that are making it really difficult for people to have the children they want when they want. I mean, ultimately, a nation's total fertility rate is the result of lots of very highly personal decisions and choices that mount up, that accumulate into one collective outcome, you know, the nation's fertility rate as a whole. But something in the UK, and also actually, in fact, in many other countries, has gone a bit wrong here because the choice is no longer a choice. People are having fewer children than they want. And people do tell us why that is. And it's because of lots of things that we, I think, quite regularly discuss and understand are a real problem. Things like the housing crisis make it difficult for you to get a home that's big enough for your family. You've got to move far away from your friends and family in search of affordable rents, affordable mortgages. We know how crucial those support networks are for young parents. Uh, IVF uh, access is difficult. IVF waiting lists are long. Childcare is expensive. These are all factors where very happily, you know, this is totally within the gift of government. You know, government can come in here, make these changes, make it tangibly easier for parents to have the children that they already want to have. Mike, is it as easy as that? I think it is. And to, to carry on from what Phoebe was saying, if mm. this comes down to government failure, we've mm. got almost the most expensive child care in the world. There are lots of people who will want to have children decide we can't afford to have children. Or if they can afford to have children, maybe they just have one. Mm. People are living in rented accommodation much more than they used to. That rented accommodation is very expensive. It's also insecure, but it is proven if people feel secure in their own home, which they've bought, they're more likely to have children at all and more likely to have more children if they do. Also, wages haven't gone up meaningfully since 2008, which is, I think, the longest period since somewhere like the 1600s. It's a very, very long time anyway. Understandably, people are feeling a lot more poorer now than they were 20 years ago when wages were consistently going up. Again, that's a reason not to have children. So we can hope, I mean, certainly I would hope that we get a change of government this year and that the government pays attention to this mm -hmm. because it's, it's like a red warning sign on the dashboard of where the country is. And it needs to change, but I mean, it is, as people were saying, the result of lots of different policy choices. One of the things we don't do in this country, though, is reward mothers or fathers or both for having lots of children. We don't do that. In fact, um, when, when they used to be, um, you know, child benefit paid, you got more for the first and less with every, every mm. subsequent child, a kind of dwindling um, amount of money, the more children you produce. Whereas in France, for example, you get extra money the more children you produce, mm. don't you? Well, I presumably do. I mean, you, you tell me. Um, I'm, so. not, I'm not good on the childcare system get, in, in France. Get, I think you get, a, I think in do, France, you get Which is a very, very sensible life choice. Whereas yes. here, we've penalised families for having more than two mm. children. We've got the two-child benefit limit. No. If you have two children, you get child benefit. If you have three or more, you don't. Yeah, exactly. Which is penalising families across the board for having more children, which, given where the birth rate at, is a ridiculous choice. I mean, firstly, it's, it's awful, in my view, because it puts children in poverty. You know, I think 43% of families with three or more children, their children are in poverty. And that is a direct result of government choice and policy choice. You know, it's pernicious. What, but, what, what, give, explain why, why you think that. Because why are we punishing children who are living in poorer households because their parents decided to have them? It's not the third child's fault that their parents decide to have three kids, is it? So we as a society are refusing to pay for that child and indeed their brothers and sisters. And, that, and isn't that because the mindset is don't have lots of children, it's terribly expensive, you've got nowhere to put them, we haven't got any you know, school places for them, we don't want them on well, we do have costing us a fortune them. on the we've NHS. Got, everyone do everyone else a favour and don't have any children or have schools, very few. Isn't we've got that schools the way we think particularly thinking? in London that are closing down because there aren't enough kids to feed them. Uh, you know, to supply them. Now, now, that isn't the case in the rest of the country, but it will become the case in the rest of the country. Hi, I mean, Jack, what... what's going on here? Because all we hear day in, day out is don't come and take our stuff, don't come and sit on our chairs, we'll run out of chairs, don't come and use our blackboards and we haven't got any chalk, you'll take all the chalk. I mean, we keep hearing about kind of de um, depleted resources that are being massively overstretched and suddenly the whole conversation has shifted in one moment to, oh my God, everything's empty, everything's closing down, we haven't got any 
want you to use any of our resources or manufacture any new ones. It seems like such a seismic shift and it feels sudden, doesn't it? Well, Vanessa, the fact is, right, and if we actually strip it down to its bare bones, this government does have the money. It just doesn't have money for people like us or the, the, your viewers. It has money for its friends, for PPE contracts and the fraud for that. It has money for the barges, which are now empty. It has money to spend on Rwanda flights where not a single person has gone for, to do a PR exercise. It has money to award contracts for defence and for weapons and to sell weapons and buy weapons. It doesn't have money for nurses, doctors, teachers, railway workers, schools, school kids, anyone elderly over the age of 70, anyone under the age of 18 needing a, a free education. For students, it doesn't have money. And that's what we've got to decide. All of this money, it appears when the government needs it for its own purposes. Mike, is this it's, extreme? I mean, Hodjab's on a soapbox. He's loving a bit of rhetoric here, but, I mean, does he mean it? Is it true? Well, I mean, it is the case that public services have been steadily run down over the last 14 years. I mean, the government came in in 2010 and immediately implemented its, its policy of austerity, which is sucking money out of the public realm, deciding that they want to spend less money. Of course, at the time, that was justified because they needed to, in big quotes, fix the economy. But, of course, what that did was, A, harm public services, which are now 14 years on, still desperately harmed, and take money away from local councils, which harms the local services as well. But of course, it didn't help the economy. It stuck the life out of the economy. We've had a fairly stagnant economy for the last 15 years as well. So the economy here is bad, but that is one thing that feeds through as people make decisions to have fewer children. And in terms of, you know, people not using services, of course, GPs are overstretched, hospitals are overstressed because they have been underfunded. But as we see lower numbers of children going through the schools, that will feed through. So in the end, you've got lower numbers of kids going to university or applying for apprenticeships or doing jobs, applying for jobs in any sector of society, whether it's social care, whether it's business, whether it's the health service, whether it's the fire service, schools, whatever it is. So, so Phoebe, what, what, do we need to, what do we need to flag up? What is the purpose of our conversation today? What are we trying to establish that people might not already know? Well, what I think I'd like to be really clear about is that I think we need mainstream politicians to be much more frank about the problem here to realise that falling fertility is a real problem, but that it's a solvable problem. You know, it's a challenge that we can actually meet. I do worry that there's a sense of sort of apathy and sometimes inevitability about the way that this issue is discussed. And that absolutely does not need to be the case. For a government that's serious about it, there's a great deal of low hanging fruit here. You know, small policy changes medium-sized policy changes that can make a real difference to parents' lives and mean that people who want to become parents anyway are ready to become parents, can do so. Changes, we've already spoken about IVF, changes in the tax system, we've spoken about the benefit system already. Part of this, I think, is an attitude shift you know, about communicating really clearly, children are good. It's important that people are able to have children because it's important for individuals and we don't want people locked out of family life, but also being frank about the fact that Socially and economically, we need children. They're intrinsically good. They're a good thing. And there are lots of changes we can make to make it easier. Thank you very much indeed, all three of you. Coming up after the break, the Bank of England announces that interest rates will remain at 5.25%. What does that mean, though, for your money? I'm Vanessa Feltz. You always talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning 
if it's singled out. Now you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Ooh, we're missing. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Welcome back. The Bank of England has announced that interest rates will remain at 5.25%, but claims that prospects for a cut are moving in the right direction. This has got everyone asking, what will it take for those cuts to be made? Meanwhile, the cost of living crisis remains a stark reality, with inflation failing to meet the Bank of England's 2% target, and Britain's favourite products are said to be suffering from shrinkflation. Easter eggs are said to be the latest victims of this, with Brits paying higher prices for smaller sized eggs. Joining us live is Jonathan Davis, economist, wealth yeah. advisor and writer of the Free Booms and Busts reports. Hi, Jonathan. Good to have you on the programme. Nice to see you. Tell me about the Bank of England and interest rates and really what this translates to in terms of real people and, and, and what's in their pockets and what's not. The Bank of England today decided again not to reduce interest rates, base rates as uh, as many com commentators had hoped that they would be doing. Um, essentially, the Bank of England is following the Federal Reserve in the United States by not cutting rates. Uh, and indeed, it looks as if rates will not fall for at least a few months. And um, people with mortgages, with debts paying interest, they shouldn't expect many interest rate cuts at all this year, perhaps one or two. Um, because quite simply, the cost of living has stopped uh, uh, the rate of reduction, the rate of increase in inflation has stopped falling. Inflation is starting to tick up again. Um, on the other side, people should bear in mind that global growth has started to tick up again. So on the one hand, it's bad for the cost of living, but on the other hand, it might mean possibly more jobs coming. So it's quite difficult to know, isn't it, what advice um, people should follow or what advice to offer people? Because obviously, you know, everybody is still embroiled and embattled in this cost of living crisis. And although we may hear and do hear quite a lot from Rishi Sunak and the government about inflation falling or at least inflation not increasing, which isn't at all the same thing, but is always represented as if it is, in, nobody seems to feel as if they've got any more money, do they? Uh, inflation is increasing. What the politicians were talking about uh, uh, was that the rate of inflation was falling, as I just said, for over a year, but they were pretending that the cost of living was actually falling. No, it was just the rate of increase in prices that was falling. Well, unfortunately, what we now have 
the rate of increase in prices is rising again. And that's why mortgage costs, um, personal loan rates, the base rate is not falling again. So um, people should continue, we're afraid to say, to have to tighten their belts. You know, last year and this year, over 2 million households saw their mortgage rates rise because their fixed rate mortgages ended. And that, as I say, goes on to the end of this year. That's over 2 million homes. Um, one and a half million homes are going to see their mortgage costs, their monthly costs, rise between 25 and 50%. So things are tight, and people should expect them to be tight for at least the next couple of years. And, and those people who will consider themselves to be casualties of that very fleeting Liz Truss administration and that particular quasi Quateng budget, and those are the people with the mortgages that aren't fixed and everything else, what, what awaits those people? Because they're quite a, a, a significant se segment of the population, aren't they? Um, I'm so sorry, Vanessa. I, I um, what, what is it that you think the Liz Truss and Quateng did? Well, I think we think that people's mortgages were, were sort of doomed to increase in a dramatic and swinging manner. Do you not agree? Right. Um, well, um, mortgages did rise, but not because of trusts and uh, quasi. Um, global um, inflation soared in 2021 20, and 22. So, therefore, interest rates soared from the beginning of 2022. It was nothing to do with the UK Prime Minister. Uh, I mean, that's a fallacy, and I'm sorry, the media has been pushing for the last year and a half. Um, the fact is, since the second half of 2022, inflation was falling until the end of last year. And what I'm saying is, global growth and inflation have stopped falling. They've started to tick up. And that's why we cannot expect the big falls in interest rates that many people were suggesting we would be getting. And because inflation is likely to be here well into next year, that's why, as I say, we should expect interest rates, mortgage rates, maybe to fall a bit, but not to fall much. And I'm sorry, it's nothing to do with Liz Truss. All right. We, we, we know that there's an election imminent. We think it's probably now going to be at the latter end of this year. Does that have an effect on the economy and have an effect on interest rates, a kind of volatility, the uncertainty and the possibility of a Labour government when Labour's traditionally been branded not the, the, the party of business or, you might say, of prosperity? General elections do normally bring about um, slight dips in an economy. Uh, and indeed, uh, uh, you, you're asking about uh, the people, the, uh, um, the, the normal person. Um, expect house, house prices to continue falling, and particularly in the three months up to the election. Um, they've been falling through 2023, and they will fall through 2024 largely because of the massive rise in interest rates. Um, bearing in mind that actually the UK general election, funnily enough, is less important to our economy than the US presidential election, which is going to happen in November. We know that for a fact. Mm. And again, yes, that will create some uncertainty. I will say to you, post both of those elections, I would expect the politicians to open the spigots, spend, 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 after, of course, borrowing, 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 um, and that will, in the short term, help the economy in 2025. The problem is that that will exacerbate inflation, and uh, the only people who will pay for that are the bottom 99.0%, because remember, Vanessa, and this is a thing that no one ever talks about, Inflation is the biggest tax of all. And that is what we have, and it's going to be even bigger in 2025. <laughs>
Jonathan, thank you very much indeed. Coming up after the break, concerns about mental health have gone too far. That's according to Work and Pension Secretary Mel Stride as he tries to get people back to work. I'm Vanessa Feltz. You're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, Oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Isn't that? Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. But you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Worm is <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. The Work and Pensions Secretary says mental health culture has gone too far as he unveils plans to get 150,000 people signed off back into a job. Mel Stride says that although he's grateful for today's much more open approach to the topic, Britain risks labelling the normal ups and downs of human life as medical mental health conditions. His comments come amid growing concern over the country's welfare bill, which is expected to hit £100 billion this year. Joining us now are psychologist Joe Hemmings and employment law specialist Gillian Howard. I think we might start with Gillian on this one. Gillian and, and Joe, welcome to the programme. So, Gillian, Mel Stride is saying that some of the, 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 the things that afflict us afflict everybody. You know, have a bad time, you might be lonely, you might be homesick, you might feel might be heartbroken, you might be all sorts of things, but those aren't good enough reasons to say that you're afflicted with a mental health condition and most particularly not good enough reasons not to go to work. And I wonder what you think about that. Yes, well, good afternoon, Vanessa, and I'm a great fan of your show. Oh, thank, thank you for having me on. I have to say I'm absolutely appalled at the what the minister has said. Has he done a survey? Has he actually asked people who are ill and off work whether they're skiving or just making it up or having an ordinary day, which we all have, where sometimes we are too tired to get up 
or have just had a bad day. These are people who have got serious mental health problems or have serious problems at work, perhaps with their bosses who have harassed them or given them too much work or haven't trained them properly, and, and they've had a reaction. There, I'm sure there are very few, if any, people who stay off work, particularly long term, who have nothing wrong with them. And I'd like to know where his empirical evidence comes from. I suppose he might feel that the kind of ubiquity of the term mental health, which, as you know, uh, of a, a previous generations never really discussed it at all. In fact, it wasn't something you would ever admit to. If you were feeling fragile mentally, you'd try and keep it hidden. I suppose that the, the perception among some people, Gillian, is that it's a huge umbrella term and it covers all sorts of serious mental health conditions, but also other things like unhappiness, general malaise, you know, low self-esteem, all the sorts of things uh, uh, that, you know, that, that, that the fragile human flesh is heir to, but that he's saying it shouldn't keep you off work. You may feel low, you may feel miserable, you may feel underappreciated, lots of horrible things that you may be going through doesn't mean you shouldn't get up in the morning and go to work. And actually, if you do, you'll feel a lot better for it. Well, that, that is one view. And, of course, it, it is a view. And a, a number of psychiatrists... Uh, take that view and therefore they recommend and encourage their patients to go back to work because work is therapy mm. you're with your friends you're engaging your mind in something other than yourself and your troubles yes so if medical advice is that it, it is going to help you help you get better help your mood if you go back to work then of course it's quite proper that the uh, person follows the medical advice and, and goes back to work but it isn't an umbrella term for everybody to, who, who has a slightly bad day or feels tired or disaffected um, that they, they stay off work. They don't. Most employees, certainly in my experience, are incredibly hardworking, very conscientious and will almost crawl into work when they shouldn't, when actually they're not feeling very well, but they don't want to let their bosses down. So do you think, Gillian, that, that if Mel Stride goes out, strides out to try to locate these skivers or these people who have been incredibly self-indulgent in promoting a perfectly ordinary bad day into some kind of mental health condition, that he won't find them? They won't be around and that this estimate of 150,000 is purely fictional, really? Yes, it's pure fiction. I don't think for a minute he's going to find any or many. Um, and I, I think this is a, a real slur on... People who, whether they've got physical or mental health problems, can't come to work. Most people want to go to work, um, and if they can't, they are very disheartened, uh, and they want to get back to work as soon as they can. Those who can't, who have really serious physical or mental problems, have to stay off work. Um, and there should be a welfare state and state benefits for those people who genuinely can't get back to work. You know, some uh, employees have jobs where they have to be on reception or in a call centre, they can't just, uh, you know, have a rest when they want to. You know, managers have a little bit more um, you know, flexibility uh, where they can take a little break. But there are an awful lot of people who work in factories, on production lines, in call centres, who can't take a break. And therefore, um, if they can't mentally or physically do their job, they have to stay off work. Let me bring Joe Hemmings into this. Joe Hemmings is a psychologist. Joe, thanks so much for being here. Um, obviously, Gillian's saying she doesn't see this. She's an employment lawyer. She doesn't see people who are, you know, feigning uh, mental ill health. She sees people who are diligent, conscientious, want to go to work and only don't go if they really are properly afflicted with a mental disorder, which means they can't go. But you're a psychologist and I wonder what you see, whether you think that there are people who are so now so comfortable with the term mental health problem or mental health condition that they might misuse it. Hi, Vanessa. I mean, I agree with a lot of what Gillian said. However, I think at grassroots level, the problem is that in terms of educational information, there isn't enough to help people, particularly younger people, I think he may be referring to them, to understand um, the difference between mild anxiety, which is fine, you know, we all have it. Where are the boundaries between everyday stresses and proper mental health disorders? And I think that boundary has been very blurred, partly because we don't have the resources, haven't been put into counselling in schools, haven't been put into 
well-being in workplaces, whatever it takes. I feel that is missing. And so if people don't understand, I think the mental health culture is wonderful. It's brilliant that we're so open about it. But there is definitely confusion in terms of resilience. That's not taught to people. What is okay to not feel great? And what is actually something that needs to be assessed? And I think doctors, GPs, they're under pressure with only a few minutes per patient, they will sign you off. For some people that don't need signing off. Dr Claire Gerrard, I heard her talking about this earlier today, and she said, for example, among students, obviously they're not part of the workforce yet, but she said among students you hear things like loneliness and homesickness, which I think most of us would consider just part of life, a kind of passing phase, a normal reaction if you're away from home for the first time, not a mental illness, but she says they miscategorise them. They think that they are mental illnesses. They see them that way. And I suppose when, yeah. when they then move into the, 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 the job force and job market, they continue to see them that way. Is that what might be happening? I think to a degree it's definitely happening because people don't understand. They just haven't got that information. They haven't got the support systems to reassure them. A lot of people need reassurance. I do a lot of duty of care work for TV shows and I come across young people all the time who have been prescribed antidepressants or put off their exams because they've been anxious about them. Well, we're all anxious about exams. So learning that resilience, learning when it's okay to feel stressed, it's quite normal, not seeing it as a mental health disorder, that information should be there, the support system should be there, and the reassurance should be there. And if you were educating them, if you were saying, now listen, you don't know this, but I'm going to tell you this because I'm an experienced psychologist, this is not a mental illness, this is just a normal part of life, this is something that is difficult, but you get through it, you know, you feel terrible on the tube on the way to work, you feel pretty awful when you walk in in the morning, but then you talk to your mate, you get absorbed in what you're doing, and by lunchtime actually you feel a great deal better, the fact that you've been able to mix with other people, the fact that you get paid at the end of the week, which gives you a sense of, you know, absolutely essential value, and you can also pay your bills, which makes a hell of a lot of sense to everybody. So go to work. It's well worth it. You'll feel a lot better. What would you say? What are the sorts of things that you need? You think that they need to know that they don't know? Well, people sort of carelessly use the phrase, I'm depressed. Now, mm. sometimes there is serious clinical depression going on, and that's relatively easy to establish. But very often it's feeling a bit low. It could be to do with the weather. It could be to do with a bad weekend. Whatever it is, we all get that and we all have to learn to manage that. So it's defining and teaching, if you like, um, what the difference is. We have to have some stress and anxiety in our lives. We cannot not have it. It protects us. It's a boundary. Um, it's a mechanism. You know, if we see, if we're anxious because there's a busy road, you know, we stop and we think about it. If we didn't, we'd be reckless. So some anxiety, some stress is actually quite important. And I just think teaching children that from a very early age, that it's absolutely normal if you're feeling low, go and get some peer support, friends, family, a counsellor, whatever it may be, a school counsellor, that will help them learn and establish what is okay and what might need further treatment. Thank you both very much indeed. Thank you for joining me. Coming up after the break, have you ever heard of the term office goggles? Well, you know what beer goggles are. Stay tuned to find out more. I'm Vanessa Feltz and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey, Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid 
for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what <laughs> just happened. <laughs> Whoa, missing. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. Now, we've all heard of beer goggles, but what about office goggles? Have you ever heard of that? Is there someone that you often link eyes with at the water cooler? Could it be true love? Or are you simply attracted to them because they're your colleague and you spend around 38 hours of the week just looking at them? Joining me in the studio now is Molly Cookson, one half of the TikTok dating and lifestyle duo Two Girls, One Pop. And down the line, we're joined by sex and relationship coach, author and hypnotherapist, Rebecca Dakin. We could all do with some hypnotherapy right now. Rebecca, lovely to see you. So, Molly, this is all um, because of you that we're talking about this. You wrote an excellent piece about it. Tell me about office goggles, because people might not know what we're talking about. Yeah, so basically, office goggles is the phenomenon where you maybe meet someone at work, and they're maybe not necessarily the sort of person you would usually go for in your romantic life, but for some reason, when you're in the office, they they just have a certain something about them and yeah. you're, you think they're love, the love of your life. Is it a little bit like the guy that drives the motorboat for the water skiing on holiday? You know, on the exactly. boat, he looks yeah. fabulous, he's got a great tan, he's in control, you're a terrible water skier, yeah. he's the boss, you're the supplicant, you're just, you know, and he just looks like the god of all he surveys. Is exactly. it that type of thing? It's exactly that. Similar to, you know, if, if you're at school and there's the one teacher who everyone sort of has a bit of a crush yeah. on and then you see him in Sainsbury's a few weeks later and you're like... Why, why was that, actually? Yeah, I think it's the, all very similar thing. On the other hand, though, in an office context, you know, you might spend a really enormous chunk of your life in that context. It's not like whizzing in for a holiday, falling in love with the guy that sells the ice cream and then coming back and thinking, what was all that about? This is your real life, your real job, so you probably really do have something in common. Yeah, and I think, for me, that's where a lot of the sort of theory behind it is I've always thought it sat because you do spend so much of your life with this person. I think there's almost that the proximity of it, you convince yourself that maybe there is something there. Um, don't get me wrong, I'm sure mm. there are occasions where mm. people do actually make really good connections and, you know, you hear stories of people that have met someone at work and then gotten on to get married. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I think the proximity definitely does play a factor. So you mean that if, for example, you went and got a job as you were some sort of seconded off to somewhere else, a different department or a different branch of the same company, as soon as you got into a different context, that person that's been the object of your desire, affection, you've been writing them sonnets every night, you've been <laughs> leaving a fresh apple on their desk every morning you've been leaning over them and hoping that your lingering perfume will seduce <laughs> them as you lean over to have a look at a memo whatever it is that person suddenly all that allure and razzmatazz will just fade away because you're no longer in the same environment 
I mean, potentially. I think that hindsight is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. And I think in, in any kind of relationship or, you know, situationship or romantic uh, pursuit, oftentimes when you look back, sometimes the rose-tinted glasses have gone and you're like, actually, was that person <laughs> right for me or, or was it just the rose-tinted glasses? Let's ask Rebecca about this. Rebecca, office romances, office goggles, you've got all this in common, you're, you're in the same boat, only you get each other because you've both got the same awful boss or whatever it is. Um, is it pretty much a doomed situation, a bit like a beer goggle thing? I wouldn't necessarily say that it's it's doomed. Um, I think, as you said, you're spending such a long time, it's such a lot of time with each other. Very often, people are, are bored at work, and it's a bit monotonous, and they're just wanting a, a distraction. So, just a little bit of flirting and a little bit of fun and, and banter um, is a really strong kind of attraction builder. So, if you're having it, it just makes the day go a little bit quicker. You know, if you can have a bit of fun and a bit of cheekiness, it's like a bit of, I don't know, yeah, a bit of excitement at work, isn't it? But what about this idea that because you're at work, the other person takes on this kind of razzle-dazzle, this tremendously libidinous, erogenous kind of characteristic that actually in real life, if you saw them as my uh, guest Molly says so beautifully, just walking about Sainsbury's, you'd just think, oh, God, I'm you? Why? I think for that reason, we you know, we want to connect with somebody at work. We, we, we like... You know, we like attention, we like to feel attractive, you know, so if you're kind of picking the best of a bad bunch or whatever at work and you find looking for something that you can find attractive and you get a little bit of banter going, it's attention, isn't it? And it feels good. Yeah, and yeah. I think, you know, it just, it, it, it can be playful, but very often the reality, you know, you've built up in your head this fantasy because that's exciting because it hasn't happened. So in your head, you can imagine that you're with the boss in the, I don't know, in the or, or whoever, a colleague in, a, in the office, uh, you know, room somewhere, you know, having your wicked way together. But the reality actually is probably really, really disappointing. So it's, yeah, we just like to fantasise, we like to romanticise. Just, yeah, for fun and to, to pass pass the time and it feels good. So, so Rebecca, so Molly, would you say that you wrote, wrote this as a note of caution to say, don't get carried away, you could regret this at your leisure, don't do it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, from my personal experience, the, the office goggles, the office romances haven't worked out. Um, <laughs> obviously, I know that there are exceptions to the rule and there are people that do meet the love of their life um, at work. But I think just enter it with caution. Maybe take a step back All and right. see. All right, we hope that, that, that uh, my beautiful colleagues, Isabel Oakeshott and the glory said, Faisy, are listening closely to this. This is the idea that office goggles apply and in, in work relationships are doomed. Um, there you go. Didn't end too well. <laughs> <laughs> we have three lovely not turned up. Well, that's all right. Then tell me, tell me, Ed, what's coming up? Uh, so we've got, talking about office, <laughs> a segue, we've got Britain's baby bust. Yes. Not enough British women are having babies, so do you fill the gap? Because you need younger people to drive your economy. Do you fill it with immigrants or do you uh, encourage people living here to have more babies. That's well, the you've got to start. debate. I and mean, if you're going to do that, you're really going to have to start making it look like a good and viable idea, aren't you? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and also, we're going to be uh, looking at Rwanda. So, obviously, the brilliant House of Lords that you admire so much has blocked the Rwanda bill. Seven votes. That you're actually but in. I, I was in the right lobby, Isabel. You'd be oh, proud of me. I don't know. So all right. folks coming over and it's all very top. Well, you can see hostilities have broken out before the show's even started. Very sadly, <laughs> we've come to the end of this show. It's the talk, as you hear, will they be shouting, I wonder, coming up next. Good night. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. I mean, there's quite a lot of game playing going on here. Oh, don't start me on that. <laughs> there's a sort of feeling they ought to look as if they're doing something. So don't accuse anyone else of stoking culture wars. Such as the smoke and mirrors of, of politics. Ruminating and fulminating and debating and voting and God knows what. You said they couldn't back the party's position. But the government has got to be more flexible. It's starting to sound like a very expensive show, this, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs>
Independent Republic of Mike Graham. Weeknights at 8 on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to ab and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat, oh. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the 